And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming to this session. And uh, in this one, uh, we have Fred Dixon, who uh, Fred uh, works with Big Blue Button. Uh, he's the, uh, yeah, one of people at Blindside Networks. Um, and um, Blindside Networks are sponsoring the iMoot and we'll do, a lot of, do a lot of work with Moodle. So, um, and uh, Everyone so far has actually been commenting how good it's been, Big Blue Button. It's a great tool and uh, yeah, certainly looking forward to hearing about the roadmap. So thank you, Fred, for your time and I'll hand over to you. Great. Thanks, Shane. So uh, I wear a number of hats, but for this converse, for this presentation, I have my open source Big Blue Button hat on and I'm looking forward to sharing with you uh, the plans we have for the product. I always assume that people haven't heard about Big Blue Button before and because these are recorded, I'll probably give the first five, 10 minutes just to kind of an overview of the history of the project, where we, how we came to be, uh, some of the activities around the project, and then I'll move into the roadmap and other stuff. As I go through the presentation, feel free to chat, and I will be happy to answer any questions you have. So in terms of the target market that we have built, have focused Big Blue Button on, it's online learning. And I pulled some stats here. There are about 4,500 degree grant institutions in North America and about 25,000 secondary schools. And 90% 90 of the degree of the degree grant institutions offer an online component. So this trend towards online learning, it's not only for the educational institution, but there's a huge social benefit to students around the world. If you had the best teacher in Canada online teaching math and anybody around the world could, could participate, that's a social benefit. So when you look at uh, the market, I always like to look at like the educational software, the learning management systems, there's about 571 options. The number one is Moodle worldwide, which is awesome. And in terms of web conferencing systems, there are about 145 available web conferencing systems. And then the natural question is, well, what about open source? And there, that's the market that we focus on is an open source web conferencing system for online learning. The goal of our project is that every student with a web browser should have access to a high quality online learning experience. And we intend to make that possible with Big Blue Button. We've been working on it for over seven years now. And that is that remains our one goal. We started back, the project actually started back in 2007 at Carleton University. I always say you can tell it was a university because it has a whiteboard. This is actually an early diagram that Richard Alam, the CTO, uh, made showing the architecture as it was back then. It's very cool. There are three use cases we look at for Big Blue Button, one-to-one, -one, so tutoring, coaching, virtual office hours, small group collaboration, we're all sharing our webcams, talking, and the traditional one-to-many, which may be a hybrid class, maybe there's students in the class and students remote. We have the, says here like 50 users or less, you'll see that all over our documentation. It's not hard-coded. We have seen classes that are much larger, but we always try to under promise and over deliver in the project. So you'll see us say we recommend for 50 users or less. In terms of the capabilities in Big Blue Button, I mean, you're seeing it here in front of you for those of you that are in the live session. For you, those of you watching the recording, it has desktop sharing, sharing of audio, chat, video, polling we added recently, and slides. Uh, that's a picture of Jesus Rodrigo. He is the developer who maintains the Moodle integration. He's been working on it over four years. A couple screenshots for the collaborative use case. You can see here, we've got four webcams. They're all in a video doc. You can arrange them various ways. If you arrange them kind of uh, in, a, in a, they'll go, they'll, they'll stack horizontally, they'll stack vertically. If you click on a video, it'll become larger than the rest. So here are eight webcams being shared and one of them has been clicked, so it becomes larger. The Big Blue Button session can be recorded as well, and it will fully play back all the content shared, including the polling. So you'll see the slide, the presentation area, there's some thumbnails, the chat area, and then the audio, the video, and the desktop sharing. And you can switch the presentation area with the video area if the desktop sharing is kicks in and you wanna see what the presenter was sharing on his or her desktop. For those techies out there, this is kind of an architecture diagram. It kind of speaks to the open source components we build on. I always like to give credit to two projects in particular. Uh, FreeSwitch, which is an open source uh, soft switch. This allows us to, this is doing the, all the audio right now. And Red5, which is kind of underneath wraps Red5. This is 
an open source implementation of Adobe Flash Media Server, and it is handling all the real-time uh, communication amongst the clients. So we really are building on some amazing open source projects. In terms of growth on the social networking, these numbers are about two weeks old. I was at the Moodle Mood in Montreal here a few weeks ago. We have 4,417 likes. In Twitter, we have about 2,600 followers. I always like to say it's all organic, no special preservatives. We didn't pay anybody to like us or follow us. And on GitHub, a, ver a mark of a healthy open source project is how many people have forked it and how many people have started. So these are good numbers and they, they continue to grow. In terms of our developer mailing list, we have over 2,000 members now. I remember when there was just three and very healthy posts. So lots of activities. You can see over 225 posts and over, uh, that's that's the mem that's the total posts, which is pretty cool. And in terms of the localization, we use TransFX to localize the product and our community localizes it. So we put up the English uh, key value pairs and other people around the world contribute and update it. TransFX is great, by the way, because we just push the latest uh, up key value pairs. And let's say there's 30 new key value pairs. All the members of the Arabic team, all the members of the Armenian team, French, Hungarian, and so on, they all get emails saying, hey, there's 30 new strings to localize. And they all go into their uh, TransFX interface. They do localization. And then we just pull the latest local localization files when we do builds. So it's over 73 languages now. And these are like the top localized ones. And many of them are coverage 100%. We do two developer summits each year. We do them, one in, Can one in Canada in Ottawa and the other one in Porto Alegre, Brazil. This is a, this is a, a screenshot. Oh, this is a picture from the last developer summit in Porto Alegre, 2014. I am headed down in a week and a half to Brazil for another developer summit. There'll be I think, six of us from Canada and some folks from the States and we'll all be going down to Brazil to work a week on the planning and design for next iterations for Big Blue Button. And it's great. There's uh, there's some really deep talent in the group. And this is a picture of the, the summit that was held in in, uh, in Ottawa here in May. There are six committers who have the ability to commit code directly to the repository. Unlike open source projects where maybe anybody can commit, that's not how we do it in Big Blue Button. Some of the members here have a telecommunications background, and we know what it's like to ship software that has real-time components to it. So a lot of work goes into review the code and to test it and to test it and to test it. So when we do a release, it is as solid as we can make it. In terms of adoption, this one, Darren Ricketts, University of West Scotland, they're Moodle. And they've been using Big Blue Button for a while. There's a, there's a, um, a video up on YouTube that he gave some comments. I did look around for, I know some of the universities that use this, University of South Alabama, you can see they use Big Blue Button. National University College. From a product management point of view, this is a really great quote. Uh, we at National University College Division are very happy with our change to Big Blue Button. As our previous solution had over 50 support tickets a month after switching to Big Blue Button, that number dropped to six or seven tickets. So. We're not marketers. My focus is on the development of an open source web conferencing system that enables remote students to have a high quality online learning experience. One of the measurements of success is adoption and also support effort. So this is really good to see because it is allowing us to say, hey, we are meeting our goals because without adoption, nobody will benefit from it. And adoption, a big factor of that is how difficult it is to support. So we try a lot, of, very hard to make the interface easy to use and to make it easy to support. Of course, you probably know that Moodle Cloud uh, was announced a few months ago and there was one third party component that was in it and that was Big Blue Button. So if you wanted to try out the latest version of Big Blue Button, you can set up an account on Moodle Cloud. It's free for anybody in the world and you can have up to six users in a session and then no recordings. That's how we're able to give it away essentially for free and expose people to it. And if you want more, the Moodle partners can certainly jump in and help out. But again, we're, the relationship that we have with Moodle is extremely important to us. We have invested a lot of effort to make sure there's a very deep integration so that all members of the Moodle community can benefit from having not only the great open source LMS that 
Moodle provides for the asynchronous part, but they can also complement it with Big Blue Button for the synchronous part. Probably the biggest design one we had recently was the US Department of Defense. They have built a system internally around Big Blue Button which they use for collaboration amongst the military and non-military. And they publicly stated that in building the system around Big Blue Button, they expect to save at least $12 million a year. You can see this article, just Google DISA, uh, Defense Information Systems Agency, and Big Blue Button. So I want to talk about the Moodle integration. So it's available in Moodle, but on Moodle.org. It's been there for quite a while. We have the integration is right back, I think, to 1.9. And as each version of Moodle comes out, we make sure that the Moodle integration is up to date. We did a bunch of work on it for the Moodle Cloud, and the latest work on it is all here. I think this says Release Canada 2. This has probably gone to 2.0. The things that we look at is how many people have downloaded it and have used it. So these numbers are really good. They, I think the, the I think this puts Big Blue Button as probably the 12th or 13th most downloadable plug, downloaded plug in the last 12 months. The adoption is number of sites using it just continues to go up. It's almost 3,000, I think. In terms of what happens when you use the Big Blue Button integration, for those of you that knew the previous one, and I think the Moodle website here actually has the previous one, there was two integrations. There was a Big Blue Button BN activity link, and then there was a recordings BN to view the recordings. And we've actually kind of combined them together now. So you can add an activity link called Big Blue Button BN. When you add it, it's very simple. You just literally have to give it a name. There's more features which I'll talk about. You can save it. Some of the other things is you can give a description that appears inside the course. You can just uh, um, have it open up in a new window and students click on it. This is a welcome message that students would see in the chat. It's usually the blue text. If you're doing an office hour, you can actually have students wait until the moderator or the teacher goes in. So. It's, they won't go into a class. Nothing is active until a teacher goes into it. You can have it's a Moodle send notification when new rooms or updates to the rooms have been made. We built in a very fine-grained uh, mapping of roles because a lot of sites will create their own roles. So you can basically say all, all users are enrolled as a viewer, and then you can map out specific roles to uh, maybe the role of moderator inside a big blue button or specific users. So lots of fine grade control. The, the area where this comes is you could basically create a, uh, uh, a big blue button link where everybody's a moderator and just tell students you can go into this anytime and practice presentation, getting ready for the next class. You can schedule a session. Basically scheduling means when the users can join and when they afterwards they cannot join. That appears in the Moodle calendar and there's support for the groups as well. And you can always say, of course, the session can be recorded. And you can even specify user limit as well, which is what we implemented to support the Moodle Cloud. One recent feature that Jesus implemented was also the ability to upload a presentation to Moodle and have that as a default presentation when you go into the Big Blue Button session. This is what it would look like inside of Moodle. So you can see the name, the title, the description. When you click on it, it actually takes you to this intermediate page that tells you, yep, the conference is ready and you can join the session and you can click join. If there are recordings for the session, actually I'll get to that in a moment. If the session is active, you can, it tells you when it started, how many people are in it. If you're the moderator, you can end the session. Of course you can join it. And if there are recordings that are available, you'll see the recordings right there. This is where we kind of able to replace the recordings BN. And if you're the moderator, you can hide and hide or publish and publish recordings and delete them as well. Students, of course, would be able to view the recordings. So that's the integration with Moodle. All that's been built on the API. So again, for the techies out there, there's about maybe 10, 12 API calls, which you can use to build an integration if you had, for example, a custom internal system at the university and college, but the Moodle integration is there. You would probably be very, very surprised if you needed it to do anything more. And if you needed it to do anything more, contact us. There are other integrations we have as well. Again, our focus is online. So our, our ability to differentiate is in part by the effort we put into integrations as well. So other LMS as well. We're 1.0 LTI 1.0 certified. And there's actually a pretty decent WordPress integration as well. Okay, so let me talk about the roadmap ahead. What is it that we've been working on and what are we gonna work on next? 
what we've been working on right now is what we're calling the 1.0 release. It's kind of funny. This is actually the 14th release over seven over seven years. Um, people have asked me why why is it not called like 3.5.1 or something. Um, we actually set people's expectations a bit low when they try out the product by having a lower version number than people would expect. So that when they do try it out, they're like, wow, this is better than I expected. And that's the effect that we were looking for. But nonetheless, the product is getting quite mature in terms of the capabilities. So we're calling this release 1.0. We released a beta for it on October 5th, and we're now testing it with our community. This site, by the way, is running the latest release. So you're, we're actually testing it right now. So the things that we did in the 1.0 have four main items is polling, and I'll demonstrate it to you. We've improved the video doc. This was how there's no more borders around it. We have emojis. So if anybody wants to click on the hand icon on the users list, they can give me a sense of how they feel about the session so far. Are they happy about it, indifferent? And the we support the Puffin browser, which gives options for uh, using Big Blue Button from uh, Apple devices, iOS devices. So I want to talk about the polling module. We actually had done an, inter an integration or build, um, uh, an implementation of polling a while back, and I just wasn't quite happy with it. It was too many buttons, too many steps. And what we really wanted was how can we make polling as really easy for the instructor? And the the kind of thought that got us onto the track we are on now is, well, when you would do a context of online learning, many times the instructor is talking about a presentation. The context for it is what's on the slide. So we said, well, what if we did a poll and the and the context for it was, this, was the contents of the slide? You can do a poll anytime, but a lot of times it's, it, it's around what the instructor is trying to communicate. So for example, here, the instructor could have a slide that says, what color is not in the rainbow? And he or she could be saying, hey, I'll give you three choices. What are they? Well, really, at this point, I would like to say, do you think it's A, B, or C? So what we did, and I see this on my interface here because I'm the presenter, we added a button which gives you true, false, or yes, no, true, false, some pre-configured choices, and the ability to add your own choices. So what happens is when the presenter does a poll, they'll see a dialog box come up and that the poll results will come back in, in real time. So every time someone votes, you'll see the bars change. And you'll also see how many people are in the session as well. At any point, the presenter can publish the results and they'll become part of the recording, or they can close it if they don't want to share the results or uh, with others. But probably they'll incorporate into their teaching in any way. What the students see is instead of a dialogue box coming up over everything saying, what's your answer to this poll? We put it right under the presentation. So again, the slide serves as the context for the poll. If you're doing things like exam review where you have slide after slide of state statement and questions, it makes it really easy to quiz the students or to get feedback from the students. And the concept of, well, how do I pre-configure the polls? Just create slides and add it to a part of your presentation and it becomes part of the natural workflow. Once the, pre once the instructor does publish, it becomes, uh, the, the results become part of the whiteboard marks and they can be annotated or even erased and you can do another poll again. And the results come right into the recordings as well. So you see them lot, you see them appear in the recording at the point at which the instructor published them. So once we all did all that, we started to look at how slides are structured. And if you take a look at say the PowerPoint template, which is there's a bullet point and some sub bullet points and you use the uh, alphabetic, alphabetic, alphabetic ordering like ABCD, the slides all have a very consistent pattern. And so what we did was, well, we looked at that pattern and said, if we see a new line, a single character and a, line, a separator, we can count those and we can make a pretty good guess that this slide in this example has four choices. So what we do is, well, let's put a button right next to the polling and say, hey, I think you have four choices here. Let me give you one button to click to initiate a poll. And we do the same thing by looking for the text true, false or yes, no, again, doing one click polling. And then you also have the ability to do a custom poll as well. And the custom polls would appear below. So, okay, so now I'm gonna actually do a poll. So all of you will be asked, what do you think is the correct answer to this? Take a guess, even if you don't know. 
hey, I've got three responses back, four responses back, five responses back, six. One of the, if you use, when you use the polling, it's common to say, oh, wait a minute, I've only got eight out of 14 responses. Who are the last people? Or maybe I've only got 12 out of 14. Polling is meant to be anonymous. It's not meant to be a way to uh, single out students. If you're looking to under, to determine if there's students away from the keyboard, you could just ask everybody to raise their hand. I'll publish the results and that looks pretty good. That looks like the correct results. I can zoom in on it if I want. I can annotate it. I can zoom out and I can even clear the results. So it's they're, they're full whiteboard marks, which just act all the whiteboard tools come into play. Okay. And the emoji icons I've already talked about. So we took the hand button and we put icons towards it. So and those icons appear in the users list. So a lot of times people ask us, what about a mobile support? And we are working on HTML5 client, which I'll talk about in a moment. But we also uh, have done some work with a company, Cloud Mosa, which is behind the Puffin browser. The Puffin browser is very interesting because it renders the web page on a server and streams the results back to the browser or to the client. And this work works on iOS and Android, tablet and handheld. And then it actually works amazingly well. So this is a screenshot of my iPad joined into a big blue button session. And I can, and then the interesting thing is the latest version of Puffin 4.6 allows the user to share their webcam and microphone in a flash application. So you can use Puffin to join a big blue button session and broadcast your webcam and microphone as well. We're still going to come out with a native mobile client for iOS at some point in the future, but this actually does a pretty good job. So if you're looking to try Big Blue Button on an iOS device, I would encourage you to download the Buffin browser. It's free for with ads and for five bucks you get it. The video doc was one of the features in the newer version. I already gave some screenshots of it. <laughs> Let me talk about the future plans. These are features that are still on our roadmap that are in progress or will be will be added. HTML5 client, I'll talk about that in a moment. Closed captioning, we're working on that. Very important. We have accessibility support for students who are visually impaired and using JAWS, the screen reader. Breakout rooms, again, one of the features we get asked. We are working on, uh, right now, the, there's a Java applet that's required to run to do the desktop sharing. Chrome has dropped support for Java, but Firefox is still there. But it too will drop support, I think, at the end of 2016. So we are working on implementing faster desktop sharing using WebRTC. That will mean that if you're in Firefox or Chrome, you will be able to share the desktop without using Java. Full screen mode, it's kind of nice if you could just make BigBlueButton full screen and hide all the menus and everything. Shared whiteboard, that's if you're tutoring somebody and you want to have maybe the tutor and the student can participate together on the whiteboard with the same tools. Synchronized video playback, that's if you wanted to put a YouTube video in and have it played back and shared notes. Okay, so let me talk about the mobile side. This kind of summarizes our thinking in terms of the clients. There are three clients for Big Blue Button. There's the web client, which we're using now, which is Flash-based. And I must give credit to Adobe. They do a really good job of Flash for all, uh, for Mac, Unix, and PC. And of course, Chrome builds it in and we have been using it for seven years. If you can, you want to, can run on a Chromebook as well. Works great. The Android. So the way we're going to do the Android is with the HTML5 client. And the way, the reason this is possible is because the audio, we use WebRTC for audio, and Android has Chrome, and Chrome supports WebRTC. On iOS, however, Apple prevents you from installing any other browser that uses a different rendering engine. So it prevents you and us from using WebRTC. Apple has not supported it yet for Safari, nor have they made any indication. What Apple would like you to do is write a native iOS app. And we will do that. It's gonna take us effort, but in terms of priority, it's certainly getting the features that we want into the, the, the web client and providing the capabilities in the mobile client, the HTML5 client. And this is a screenshot of the HTML5 client. So what we're trying to do for the first iteration is provide all the capabilities that a, a viewer, a student would have. So they can raise their hand, they can respond to polls, they can do the chat, they can see other chat, 
They can do private chat. They can see everything that happens on the presentation area. And they can join the audio, either listen only or uh, the microphone. And that, again, is WebRTC. There's no flash involved. So this is a screenshot of it. This is another screenshot of I've taken a, an Android phone and done, done a portrait. So again, it's responsive. And this is what it looks like full screen. So the idea is the student is on, in transit, they're on a bus, they don't have access to a laptop. The class is going on, they pull out their Android phone, they join through Moodle and they see everything the instructor says. So the goal is a instructor never has to ask students, can you see what I'm looking at? Can you see what I'm pointing at? So that's what we're working on for the HTML5 client. It's pretty far along. We're working on getting the desktop sharing into it. And you'll see more about that in the coming months from, uh, if you go to bigbluebutton.org, you'll see more announcements. So yeah, this sort of summarizes what we're looking to do. First phase will be basically the viewer capabilities, view presentation, desktop sharing, two-way chat, two-way audio, respond to polls as well. Then we'll add another iteration where we add presentation controls, then we'll do two-way video, then we'll add the moderator controls. And as you can see, as we go down this list, we get more and more parity with the Flash client. So the end result is we don't have to say to people, we have no client right now, just wait until we do the HTML5. We have a really good client and the HTML5 provides an additional entry point into it. So if there's 15 people in the list, the instructor doesn't have to care, is somebody on an HTML5 client or a Flash client? It's the same to them. But over time, you can see the HTML5 client, our goal is to make it same capabilities, and at some point it could replace the Flash client. But we can do this in stages. And then we're also, we'll be working on a, an iOS client, but we're putting the priority right now on the HTML5 client. We think that's a bigger win. The last slide is we put a lot of effort into documentation for Big Blue Button, how to set it up, how to configure it, how to do development, localization, the architecture, the releases. Uh, I think there's probably over almost well over 100 questions in the FAQ we answer. Just at docs.biglubutton.org. And that's it. I'd be more than happy to have any take any questions that folks have. This is my contact information. So David asked, if I've entered listen moly mode, how do you change the mic mode? Just click the headset icon again, you'll drop out, then click it again, and you'll come back in with the audio chooser and choose microphone. Any other questions? Sure, Elmer, just type away. The great thing about chat is anybody can type questions at, at any time. How would instructor build templates for sessions for courses? So in Big Blue Button, it's really easy. You're uploading a PDF file or a Word document or PowerPoint, but if you save it as PDF, you'll get the best translation because the fonts come with it. And that's it. So with the, with the presentation, you, just like I gave here, uh, you can now embed polling questions in it as well. So there's nothing to configure. You go into Big Blue Button session, it's ready for uploading the slides, for chatting, sharing webcam, microphone, desktop. It can be recorded. You can specify that in the Moodle integration. There's a start stop button here, which we use to start and stop the recording at any time. And you, uh, after everybody leaves, the recording is made by the Big Blue Button server. And when the Moodle server requests the Big Blue Button server, hey, do you have any recordings for the session? It returns back the links and that's what appears inside of Moodle. Go back to the, um, the screenshot of what it looks like. So there's kind of three components at play here. There's Moodle, a Moodle server, there's a big blue button server, and then there's the Moodle plugin. And that Moodle plugin is available off of Moodle.org. And that bridges, that provides the interface from the Moodle server to the big blue button server, which is what you use to join this session. When you log out, you'll go back into Moodle and you'll be able to see the recordings there as well. Vinny asks, uh, is big blue button available through Moodle Cloud? So it, it actually adds to the whole mix. Moodle Cloud is, is reaching 
users that might not have been exposed to Moodle before. So for me, and I think Martin may share a little bit of this, but I'm just speaking on my behalf, I see Moodle Cloud as a long-term play that just increasingly grows the adoption of Moodle, which is a good thing for us. And it also exposes people to BigBlueButton, which is open source as well. If someone wishes to set up their own Moodle integration installation, they can set up Moodle on one server, they can download and set up BigBlueButton on another server, they can use the BigBlueButton plugin, it's all open source. So I think we're gonna see an increasing exposure. Uh, the world's a very big place and I'm very happy to be part of Moodle Cloud. I think it does have an impact too. We certainly see it and the downloads for Big Blue Button have not decreased over time. They've just actually increased over time. Uh, you can have Big Blue Button launch within Moodle. You don't, there's nothing to change in the Big Blue Button interface. The parts that you can change are the default presentation, the title of the presentation and the welcome message. Um, we didn't try to theme Big Blue Button. You'll notice that the UI in Big Blue Button is very somber. It's kind of grayish. The goal is that it just fades in the background. So uh, technically we could have done it, but to be honest, uh, we figured out that the value is in making Big Blue Button do the things that the instructor expects it to do for teaching students online, to make it really easy for students and to build a deep integration. If people wanted to brand Big Blue Button or change it, the code is there. There are companies that can help you out. But um, we just made the interface, you know, if you look at any photo editing tools, it's a very somber interface because the focus is on your photo, not the tool. It's kind of the same theory behind Big Blue Button. How many people, Elmer can ask, how many people can be in a session at the same time? We recommend 50 users or less. We have seen larger sessions, uh, much larger sessions. There's a lot of factors at play in terms of how many people, depends on the server bandwidth to and from the users, the capacity of the server and so on. But I'll, there's no hard coded number in Big Blue Button. I've seen some very big sessions, um, but from the point of view of the project, we would recommend 50 users or less. Other questions? We have a couple more minutes, so feel free to ask away. <clears throat> How hard is it to build a failover big blue button cluster? Um, haven't tried it, so it's an interesting question. So the the idea is that in real time, okay, so the idea is in real time, you have an active meeting running and the meeting, something happens on the server and you fail over that meeting in real time to another server. That is a very hard problem. And it's one that we do not try to solve. So our philosophy is that Big Blue Button is like a web server. It doesn't know anything about the meeting before it happens. Um, just like you don't tell your web server tomorrow at two o'clock, I'm going to download a file. You just request the file, it downloads and your web server goes on to the next one. Same philosophy behind Big Blue Button. So from a product management point of view, we put everything into making the single Big Blue Button server as solid, usable, the features and security and scalable in that order. So I think our answer to failover if the Big Blue Button server is a trouble is aside from hardware issue, let's just work on Big Blue Button so it really runs really well, like Apache or others, and it doesn't have a trouble. Um, the, the, the complexity around doing real-time failover is very high. And we'd rather, I think our, the community is better served by us making just Big Blue Button more stable as we do for every release and implementing the features that teachers need and students expect. Some people times, sometimes people ask, well, what if I could combine two Big Blue Button servers together? Could I make a larger meeting? Well, no, it's the same thing like, well, can I have two Apache web servers running together and serve more files? No, you would just have Apache web server one serving some files and Apache web server number two serving other files. So there's no concept of shared memory or shared resources. It, it turns out in the last seven years, servers have gotten really powerful and 
bandwidth has gotten really good. So um, you can get pretty far with a single big blue button server in terms of capacity. And if you get to the point where you need more capacity in the big blue button server, there's commercial companies out there that would be glad to uh, help you. And if you wish to fund some of the development, you could certainly help accelerate development in this area. In the absence of that, we're pretty much going to work on what you saw on the roadmap. Other questions? It's always an interesting question. Eric asks, is there an anticipated time frame for the iOS app on the roadmap? So um, Eric, if you're in software development, you may hit all your targets, but we've learned in an open source project, uh, we, don't give, we don't give dates. Uh, we release on quality, not dates. So, I learned this really early on in the software project. We had, it's like six or seven years ago, we didn't, we'd didn't done a lot of development for a release. And I think I probably mentioned when I thought the release was gonna be in the forum. And when we, after all the work, we released it and we thought this is great, it's open source. I hope people will benefit from it. And somebody posted, uh, you're late. And we were like, well, wait a minute, we did all this for, we volunteered our time. What was, what was the, where did the criteria for late came from? And then we realized we did it to ourselves by giving the date. So we switched to uh, a quality-oriented release process. And the way I always say it is you can tell how close we are to release by the stage we are at the development process. So for 1.0, we are finished the development. Uh, we cannot find any more bugs. It is now in beta. And we're now working on testing, the, testing it, fixing anything else the community finds, updating packaging documentation, and getting that bug count to zero. And then and only then do we do release a release candidate. And for us, a release candidate must be the final release. When we do release it, all we can change is remove the words RC. So it is the final release. Um, in terms of the iOS, we would love if there was commercial interest to accelerate it, but you can see it on our roadmap. But it has the third priority. The first priority is the web client, which is what we're using here and the features we want to develop. The second is the HTML5 client, which I think gives us a really good option on the mobile. Um, Puffin Browser actually kind of gives you a cool option and worth trying out. And then yes, Apple requires you and us to create native clients and that's what we will be doing. But from a resource point of view, that's kind of the hierarchy that we're gonna follow. I think that gives the biggest win to the community. Okay, a few more questions, a few more moments. I think we have till... 45, so there's six minutes left if anybody else has any other questions. And you, you could always join our mailing list, our community, but uh, more than happy to answer any questions. I should say, does anybody has anybody used Big Blue Button at their school? Uh, is any school here uh, hosting uh, or actively using Big Blue Button? Yeah, so the mailing lists and the community are available to support. Jeff uh, asks how easy it is to set up your MB Blue Button server. So, Jeff, I guarantee you that you will be able, to, if you have a server, the configuration that specified in the installation docs, you can just go to docs.bigbluebutton.org. Actually, I'll give you the link here. So docs.bigbluebutton.org. Okay. That's the link to install. And I will guarantee you that you will be able to install a Big Blue Button in 30 minutes or less, or we'll give you your money back. We're the only open source prof software project with a money back guarantee. Thousands of people have gone before you though. Those instructions uh, have been well vetted and tested. So we put a lot of effort into making sure they do work really well, that the installation process is fairly straightforward. It is a complex piece of software, but there's a lot of intelligence in the installation scripts. So you will, 
if you start off with the uh, the recommendation recommended configuration, you should have a working Bigby button server pretty quickly. Okay, I think we're good. Shane, what do you think? Yeah, look, well, let me take the the opportunity just to, um, on behalf of the IMET team, to thank you once again, Fred, for um, coming in and, and presenting on Big Blue Button, and also to thank um, Blindside Networks for sponsoring this whole um, IMET as well. I really do appreciate it. And again, we've we've used um, everyone here. We've used Big Blue Button for several years now for the for the IMET, and it's just run beautifully. We've really enjoyed using it. Uh, so thanks, Fred. Thanks for your time. And um, but sure, if there's any more questions, go for it. Cool. Thanks everyone for coming. Let's just turn off the recording.